Hello, everyone. Hiya. Hello. Hi, Hiya. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I see Hello. some familiar faces. Hey, thank you for being here, man, guys. Um, I don't know how I can help you all, but I shall try my best. I think we're waiting for more people to come in. Yeah, so uh, let's just take maybe like two or three more minutes. I see people coming in, coming in, coming in. So let me just let them in. Yeah, right. isn't it amazing how people are just so used to Zoom nowadays? They're like, whoa, you know, so easy. Um, yeah. I love Zoom. Hi guys. Who's that? It's me. Oh yes, hi. Ellie. I was just going to say, recognize this house. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about this juchi at walk and you know this <laughs> you see this painting over here that's what the artist left me after the last um when they came to stay in my house uh for the last juchi at arts walk and then they did this beautiful you know sort of impression of my house at that time and then they left it for me <laughs> so yeah. while we're waiting for other people I don't know whether you can see my phone that's a photo of my cat so ridiculous <laughs> ridiculous cat Okay, I think um, I don't see anyone on the waiting room at the moment. So okay. we can just start first and as and when they come in, I'll just have more people on the screen. I agree. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our old volunteer workshop on the art of storytelling with King. So uh, I'm Hui Shi, the community manager at O. Some of you might have seen me around. Uh, if you haven't, maybe I'll see you around sometime, hopefully. And um, Supe is also here today. Uh, Sup, do you want to say hi? Hello. Uh, most, of you, most of you know I'm Supe. Uh, I haven't seen some of, some of you for so long. For instance, Lawrence. Hello. Um, thanks for attending this course. I'm in charge of Q&A this morning. Um, I'll be consolidating your questions. Um, simply send them to me via private message um, during the session. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Yep, back to Hui oh, Okay, yeah. So I'll just start with some housekeeping stuff before we go into the workshop. Uh, so as mentioned, she's consolidating the questions. And today I'll be dealing with the tech side of things. So if you have any issues with Zoom, uh, drop me a private message uh, chat box on the right side. I hope that I will be able to solve that for you. And um, another thing is, uh, do keep yourself muted throughout the, um, the workshop. King might arrow some of you randomly to participate in certain parts of um, the session. And during that time, you can just unmute yourself. And another thing is, I will also drop a few polls in between the sessions. So it will appear as a pop-up on your screen MCQ, very easy. You can just click what, um, what your choice is. And at the end of the session, we also have a survey, like always, that we hope that you can help us with to finish that. And um, I'm also recording this session. Uh, so it will be put up on the volunteer Facebook group and emailed to, some of, uh, emailed to you guys as well for, for if you want to view it again. And the last thing is uh, I might pop in a couple of times to do a time check so we don't overrun for the session. And yes, that's all from me. So um, let's welcome our teacher, King, <laughs> for today. <laughs> so shall I begin? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is I've never considered myself a teacher. Um, I... I, um, I, I 
always think I'm a really, really bad teacher. Um, but what I'd like to think of today's session is more like um, maybe a sharing session more than anything else, just to share some thoughts um, and to also listen um, to all of you because um, I think that probably is the first step um, to storytelling or, um, or volunteering. Um, I, I do feel uh, that for this particular session, it would be really nice uh, for those of you who don't have your videos on uh, to turn it on because I'd love to see your faces um, because this is uh, a session about about communicating and about storytelling. And I think one of the first things that I feel is effective communication is to be able to look at somebody, um, you know, so that I am able to read what all of you are, at, at least to a certain extent, what all of you are thinking or feeling. And I think that is usually the first step to communication. Um, two other things and that uh, before I go on to the first session and that is every time you hear these two phrases storytelling or um, volunteering you think very much about you putting something out I storytell or I volunteer but actually for effective storytelling it is always a dialogue it's not just you telling a story it is about why you tell the story and how you're telling the story, which has a lot to do with how the other person is reading and accepting and understanding the story, or else it, it's no use, it's just going to be a waste of time. The other thing also about volunteering is, it's not just I volunteer, it's about why we volunteer and how it makes us feel and how it makes the other people feel, which ultimately I think is um, a kind of authenticity or truth uh, which can make not just volunteering, but everything that we do uh, anchored somewhere and makes people feel something, hopefully something good, and therefore continue to do it and continue to do it well. Those basically are the tenets of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and um, I think all of you received an email, <laughs> a little homework that I've asked everybody to do. Um, and I thought it would be really nice to begin this session with a real sharing. And therefore, I just want to reinforce that this is a safe space. You know, there is no right, there is no wrong. I've never taught storytelling before. I, I don't see this as teaching. And so if I'm going to ask you to share a story, just just share it, share it in as truthfully, you know, um, a way as possible. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to earmark somebody to just kick off for us, okay? And um, after that, all of us will go into the next session where we will talk supportively, but honestly about the five stories that we're going to hear and just to share what worked for us and what didn't, okay? Uh, we do this all the time actually in the theater um, to learn how to be able to, um, to make and help all our performances get better. Uh, and it's important to know the effect that we have on other people. So in a sense, storytelling is like a little bit of a performance. Okay, so, so that's where we're going to start. Okay, so um, can I hear a story from, um, can I hear a story from Jason? <laughs> yeah, hi, sure. Okay, hi, I'm Jason. Hi, Jason. So my story is, hi, Jason Hua. So okay, my story is okay, uh, right now I am actually uh, mostly at home with my aunt. Uh, my aunt okay, doesn't usually stay with me. She's staying like okay, on her own in this okay, one room flat, the one room rental flat. And uh, ever since this COVID-19 happened, 
uh, I'm actually very concerned for her because she's the kind that people will say she likes to go and pa pa out. That's Hokkien for like a, uh, someone who likes to run around going <laughs> places. And she has this hobby. She likes to be standing at the MRT station collecting secondhand newspaper okay, from the commuters. Uh, she likes to recycle okay, the new paper, the daily new paper. And that's the morning routine. Evening routine, she likes to go and collect drink cans. Drink cans that have been like, okay, uh, discarded by those uh, uncles who uh, will be drinking like, at the boy deck, at the open spaces. So she has this wonderful uh, daily routine that keeps her very occupied. But that also could be uh, not uh, the best routine to be having during the COVID-19 period because she's always going out, she's always pa pa out. So I asked her to come and stay with me, the two of us, go up okay, in my, okay, um, uh, at this place I have. Mm. And uh, after a while, her routine starts to become my routine. <laughs> she will be exercising at 10 a.m. I will have to exercise with her at 10 a.m. She eats at 1 p.m. I eat at 1 p.m. Of course, I'll be cooking at 12.30 p.m. So that we can have a meal together. She'll be napping at 2 p.m. And I have to make sure my Spotify is tuned to Hawkins songs for her. So that she can fall asleep to Hawkins songs. Uh, and then at night, she'll be watching all the Hawkins drama that I'll be downloading from YouTube for her. So all of a sudden, I realized that I'm actually living my okay, auntie's routine. So I laugh at the, uh, I, I would tell a joke to my friend. You know what? I'm not running a one-person senior activity center. <laughs> And I'm doing everything right now at home okay, for my aunt. And uh, she's a lovable person. Uh, but sometimes I feel I'm actually doing all this, right, for nothing. Because I asked her, so do you want to go back home again? And she would give a big resounding, yes. Huh? You mean I'm doing all this and yet you want to leave me okay, on my own and go back home? Ah, uh, Okay. So I'm actually thinking that while I feel that I'm running a one-person senior at this centre, she must be thinking she's running a one-person childcare centre and I am that child that she's caring for. Uh, so I don't know whether like, all the effort I'm making uh, is actually getting through to her until like, one day uh, she was asking me like, because I am on my computer working from home, then she's asking me, what, are you still at home? Uh? Why aren't you still Okay, why aren't you going back to work? Let's just show her in Hokkien. Uh. Oh, in that case, right, I have more time for you. I quite want to learn that it's a lot. We can keep each other company. That's the first time I told her how I felt. And it was nice because she just responded with a smile. That's wonderful. Thank you so That's much. That's a wonderful story, Jason. <laughs> That's a really great story to, <laughs> to start off. Yay! Silent clap from everybody. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> I got so many thoughts in my head. Give me just 15 seconds to get a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, in the meantime, I see some new people have joined. So, hi, new people. Uh, walking is a way I'll just... Um, like let y'all know a bit about what we mentioned before which is uh for throughout the session um do keep yourselves muted and king will point for a few participants and you can unmute yourselves then yeah yay okay <laughs> that was wonderful thank you very much jason for being so um generous and jumping in there and sharing so nicely. Okay, let's hear from somebody else. Um, I'd love to hear from uh, Eleanor Yo. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, so I'll give it a shot. Um, my story is titled My Mountain Adventure. So many, many years ago, when I was younger and had better knees, I took up an invitation from some of my friends to climb Mount Kinabalu. So I, I had heard about other people's experiences about climbing this mountain, but I had not seen their photos, nor had I done any research or actually that much training before the trip. So on the day of the climb, 
uh, me and my friends, we all set out very eager and enthusiastic, but fatigue soon set in. And uh, as, all, as we were tracking our way up, we were passed by a group of school children who were practically scampering up the hill and leaving us in the dust and they made us actually feel very old. Um, then midway through the climb, the sky suddenly opened up and it started to pour. So we finally made it up to the rest stop, which is about three quarters of the way up the mountain, soaked to the skin. And uh, we were welcomed by a cold shower to freshen up, but luckily we had a warm dinner. So the final ascent up uh, to the mountain top was uh, commenced at about 2 a.m. And this was up a slippery steep and rocky terrain that was lit only by a headlamp. At this point in time, I was actually quite grateful that I had not done much reading up about the experience before I'd gone. Because if I'd known how scary and tiring this last leg um, of the climb was, was going to be, I might not have embarked on the trip at all. The last 500 meters or so uh, to the summit was the most arduous. We had to stop every few steps or so to gasp for breath in the thin air. We were, however, rewarded by a spectacular sun, sunrise at um, the top of the mountain. But as me and my companions were heading back down the mountain, um, all of us said the same thing. We said, take lots and lots of photos. We're never doing this again. <laughs> That's the end of my story. <laughs> you guys are amazing. <laughs> You're really making my morning. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you. Okay, we're on a roll here now. As we go on to the third story, for the rest of you, reduce any pressure, okay, <laughs> based on the other two stories. I know what y'all are thinking, okay? <laughs> reduce any pressure. Because don't be the Singaporean, uh. don't be like, ah, they, this person was so good, I am this, I am that, my story so lousy. Don't start judging yourself because it's not about that. I mean, already from two stories, I just feel like the air in the room, my room right here, you can see it, it's just different. And that's what, that's what this is about. So if we just keep adding on to the air in the room together, I think ultimately that's how we all just are going to be able to do what we want to do better. Okay, um, let's listen to, let's listen to somebody that I cannot see. <laughs> because some, somebody called Ernest. <laughs> oh, Ernest just switched on his video. <laughs> okay, Ernest, let's, let's listen to your story. Okay. Uh... I'm going to be the typical Singaporean here because, <laughs> because in school we were taught that you know, every story should start with right? So just going to start with that and translate. Um, on a wing, peaceful, sun, beautiful morning. Uh, okay, this, this is the story of Inchek Ahmad. Um, so Inchek Ahmad, not his real name, um, is from the Mantaka generation, uh, if not from the Pioneer generation. And he has survived many crises to get to where he is today. Um, Inche Ahmad works in the CBD, uh, which is the envy of many. His office has spectacular views of the city skyline, the envy of many too. Uh, he works in the essential services, specifically environmental services and flood prevention management. During the circuit breaker in a city devoid of crowds, it's easy to see Inche Ahmad on the ground floor of Raffle City in his office. Um, yet one day, he was nowhere to be seen. So as I scanned the surroundings again, I saw him kneeling on the road under the merciless blazing sun, digging out fallen trap leaves in drain holes with his bare hands. He then used his broom to sweep these leaves into the dustpan and threw them into the dustbin on his trolley. So all in a day's work. My heart sank and I hope yours did too upon hearing this story. And we shouldn't let our hearts be easily lifted again without asking what we can do for the thousands of Inche Ahmads. So I hope you can walk away with that thought-provoking question and search for a meaningful answer. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for also translating because my Hawaii is very <laughs> zero. I got zero Hawaii. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm enjoying myself so much. Um, thank you, Huisha. I got the, uh, the five-minute meeting. 
Um, I'm going to go quickly to one more um, because that may be all the time that we have for this first section. Can I have a story from Pao En, please? <laughs> you know why I chose you, Pao En? I saw you opening up the Kopi O packet. Eh? And I can tell you that that's what I do every morning. So, in, in solidarity, I'm choosing you to tell your story. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, I mean, honestly, the copy was to avoid getting picked on, but <laughs> um, so I'll tell the story of how I got my tattoo. It's uh, didn't turn out. It, it didn't. Uh, it didn't go the way I expected. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm a you know very serious and thoughtful person. So when I wanted to get a tattoo, I thought very long and hard about it. I, I did all my research. I was like, what's the style I want? What design do I want? What do I want to have on my, on my skin for eternity? So this is a very serious deal. And I, I found a really good uh, tattoo artist and uh, made my appointment, went down. So I'm going to do this. <laughs> So I, I was I had my serious face. I was talking to the guy, and uh, and um, he's a he's a tattoo artist with thirteen years of experience, you know, specialist in the style that I wanted. So we had a good discussion on the meaning of the tattoo that I wanted and where I wanted it. I wanted a small palm size thing on my back, small palm size. Um, so. After all this very, very productive discussion, I asked, uh, so what are your rates? You know, you can't ask at the start, you have to ask after having a serious discussion with the men, right? And well, I, I won't say exactly what they were, but I nearly fell off my chair, but I had to keep the same face. I was like, is that right? Okay, I knew that, I knew that. <laughs> so that was the first sign I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, then after that, I made the booking for my appointment. The second sign that I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I didn't need one session, I needed two sessions, two sessions, <laughs> a few, like a few hours. I was like, um, I wasn't expecting this, I thought it'd be two hours. But so I had two sessions and I found out later that you don't need to book the two sessions one day after another, you're supposed to space them out. I did not have them spaced out, they were back to back. And there's, no, there's a name for this and it's called a pain train. <laughs> So the third, the third thing that didn't turn out as expected. So when I turned up for my appointment, uh, I had this drawing in mind that we had dis discussed and agreed on it. And on, the, on my phone, it was definitely palm size. It was a palm size drawing on my phone. And then the artist printed out the stencil and it was the size of my forearm. Like, I was like, whoa, that's not palm sized on my back. And he said, I, I, I said, can you, can you print it a bit smaller, a bit smaller, you know, a bit smaller. It's my first one. And he, he looked at me and said, if it's any smaller, the details won't be good. I printed it out just a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller than my form, like maybe like that. Like, All right, here we go. So that's how I came to have a forearm size, nearly like a half pack tattoo <laughs> and only so far. He said that I would definitely, he said that you never stop at your first tattoo. So far, I'm not sure about that. I might, <laughs> I might. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your pain. And I'm very glad that not only do we share Kopio, but I have, a, I have a serious, I have a very serious face. It's such a serious, scary face when I turn it on. Um, sadly, I know that I, I, I had aimed for five stories. We've got four, but they're really amazing stories. How about we just do a silent clap for all the storytellers. Thank you so much for being so game and for sharing your stories. Okay, um, in the next 15 minutes, um, I'm going to ask, uh, again, I'm, I think I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll actually earmark people. Um, to give short um, feedback uh, on the stories that, on the four stories that 
that you've um, that you've heard, and then I will give my own feedback. So, um, how about we start with um, uh, Kevin? Okay, so Kevin, can you tell me which of the four stories was the most effective for you? Which of the stories was the most effective for me? I think for me, I mean, it's quite it's quite close, but I think it would probably be Eleanor's. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I think more, not so much because of the storytelling itself, but just that this whole idea, the theme, I guess, the subject of climbing a mountain, oh. which is interesting to me, I suppose. So, yeah. your, so your first, the, the first thing that connected you with Eleanor's story yeah. um, is the subject matter. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you know Eleanor? No. I guess, okay, no. great. Okay, great. So you don't know her. You just and, uh, connected with the subject, store, you know, the subject of the story and that was your first, you know, you, you found that was what pulled you in, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a, that's a very good point, you know, for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to go with somebody else. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but is it Yi Yue? Yi Yue. Can you tell me how to pronounce your name? Yi Yue. Yi Yue. Yeah. My Mandarin is zero. Okay, so which story um, spoke to you the best and why? Uh, I think that would be Pao En's story. Okay. Uh, yeah, I really like the delivery. Like, okay. Or maybe like something to do with her facial expression. Because okay. like it was, it was something that... Uh, like you keep wanting to find out what actually the the like keep <laughs> so there was a lot of anticipation about what actually happened at the tattoo parlor. Yeah, and like the way she uh brought up like one like the three things that was unexpected. Yeah. Okay. So to summarize, one, you were drawn in by the storyteller's face. Mm -hmm. Two, you liked the subject matter and the way in which she told it kept you glued onto the story because there was a suspense yeah. as to how the story was going to turn out. Okay? And then thirdly, you liked the delivery of it. The way, and I guess delivery means the way she speaks, the tone of her voice, all these things which really are X factor. I mean, it is what people call an X factor. The more you try to manufacture that, the more difficult it is. Just because somebody else likes it and you try to speak in that person's voice, in that person's way, honestly, that's where you diminish your X factor. But everybody's got their own sort of X factor when it comes to how they deliver stuff. And then we'll get into a little bit more of that later. However, the subject matter and the fact that she kept things suspenseful that is something that I think can be learned. And, uh, and again, later on, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, let's, let's hear a little bit more about what you guys um, felt. Um, Zaki, can you tell me which story you liked and why? Um, I think the, the story that really stood out to me was um, uh, Jason's story. Um, okay. Because... He had quite a difficult threshold to me because he was the first person I could tell the story. And he told it in such an animated way that it <laughs> broke the eye. And it was also very personal. So I also, um, I, I also uh, felt that I could relate to, in that sense, that vulnerability and sharing a story about relationships, uh, which not everyone is comfortable with. So I felt that in him sharing that story he was sharing a part of himself and I felt moved to, to like if I if I were to share a story then I would also want to share like a part of myself because I felt that was a, a selfless way of of giving a story yeah I like that um I'm going to hear uh I I, I think you you explained yourself uh very well Zaki so I, I don't have to um I don't have to summarize for you, but I want to hear a little bit more from people. Cheryl, can you tell me which, which story spoke to you and why? Um, for me, it was Jason, same as Saki's. 
course, um, I like the way how he actually related his own personal story, plus the fact that um, there was a tinge of humor in it as well, you know, in terms of how he mentioned he ended up like running a senior activity center for, for one person. <laughs> Where else I think for his aunt probably see him like a child, even though he's a, he's a full grown adult. Yeah, so I, I thought his story kind of like stood out for me, not to say that the rest uh, didn't, but I think sharing from a personal um, um, part, it, it left a deep impression on me. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I realize there are two Cheryls <laughs> in this room. I'd also love to hear from the other Cheryl. Could you tell me uh, about your thoughts? Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I, I, sorry, I, I was a little bit late, but I joined when Jason was sharing his story. That's not late. He was the first one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I thought that story spoke to me because of the way that he delivered it. Um, he was completely animated into the story, even though the subject matter might not be something that I immediately related to, but it was something that I truly felt his passion coming through. And so for me, when I think about the emotional uh, aftermath of listening to the stories, in my mind, I might not remember all the details that all the three storytellers said, but when I walk away with the emotion, I think for me, Jason left the most like, memorable and strong emotions. Wonderful. Judith, can you tell me your thoughts? Okay, uh, hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think I, I quite liked Bowen's story, but more for frivolous reasons, because I think I felt that I could really relate to that. Like, I could see myself totally in her shoes and <laughs> be able to make the same mistake. So I felt that I liked Bowen's story because I felt like that could really be me. And yeah, maybe I should learn from her experience as well. So there was kind of like a little lesson at the back of my mind about, oh, if I ever want to do a tattoo next time, this is what I should not do. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just going to ask one more person and then, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of my own assessment about some of the strengths um, from the stories that we heard. So um, Sue, is it Sue Yen or Sue? That's what I do. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, Would you like it's, to tell it's us Su which... Suyen, whichever one you okay. everyone in open house calls me Suyen, but it, everyone else calls me Su. So okay, hello. I, um, my favorite one, I think, was Onesis. Um, simply because it was, I thought, uh, as traditional a storytelling as you get. It was a story, um, and I liked that there was a there was a twist. To it. I like how he set off going, you know, office, you know, the, the whole, you, you know, you're thinking in Jake was, it was in the office and after that, you know, like there was a little twist to the story as well. And there was a little bit of, um, there, there was, a, there was meaning to it. Yeah. And that sort of community minded spirit to it. So it was, um, you know, you write like two or one in, in school, you know, like composition in school is always like, you have to have that, that beginning. So the film her really bit really amused me. Like that was earnest, right? Um, yeah, uh, you know, so it just felt like, you know, like uh, there, there was that little tinge of nostalgia to it as well. It felt as though, you know, I was in like traditional, in primary school writing and composition again, it was like that whole, that whole um, um, theme to it, which I quite enjoyed. I thought it was a, it was a nice twist to, to storytelling. Fantastic. Yeah. You know what? Um, I've decided to hear one more before I share my own thoughts. Um, so Law, can you, can you tell me what which story spoke to you and why? Yeah, I was about to grab my phone and uh, look at my notes, but just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I agree with uh, the, the previous uh, the person that shared. I think Ernest, I think what connected with me is the open-endedness to the story, the thought-provoking part. And I generally like to hear stories like that, that doesn't have a conclusion. You just leave it to the viewers or leave it to my, my own interpretation in terms of how the story should end. And then we can have a discussion with my friends whenever somebody is sharing their own story. So uh, yeah, to me, I think that kind of like has that um, 
ability to keep things open-ended and you know keep discussion following after that and uh, leave some room of imagination as well. So that's how I feel uh, from Ernest's story. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do next is, um, as I go through some of the things that spoke to me um, with regards to the storytelling, I'm also going to marry some of that with what I consider could be some uh, ways in which we can tell our stories better. So I will marry the feedback with a little bit of, for want of a better word, and it's such an intimidating word, technique. Um, but I don't want you all to think of the word technique too much because sometimes technique, you know, uh, with regards to something as organic as storytelling can only make your stories more boring. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think you all uh, will understand that. Um, okay. The stories that spoke well to me were the ones, one, um, when I looked within the Zoom window of, um, uh, of the storyteller, that person was looking right at me because I was looking right at them. And therefore, they captured my attention because they were looking right at me. And, um, and Jason, uh, Bao En, both of you did that. Um, now, everything I'm going to say is not judgment, okay? I'm just sharing. But you looked right at me and I felt special. I felt that you were telling me the story, whether or not it's through Zoom or whether or not it is face to face. Um, it just immediately makes me feel special. Now, um, we are all human. We all want to feel special. And as we go through our daily lives, when we whittle down the things that we do, no matter how, you know, people just like to feel something good and people just like to feel something special. Um, and I think that worked really well for me. What all four of you did that worked really well for me, you all immediately made yourselves as storytellers vulnerable. What do you mean by vulnerable? Vulnerable doesn't mean, oh, now I'm opening myself out to people that can attack me and criticize me and say things. No, no. Vulnerable just means, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to tell you this thing. And let's just all hope for the best. Let's look at political speeches, which I'm sure all of us heard during the elections. A lot of times it is not about how well you speak the language or what vocabulary you have, whether or not you have very difficult words or whether or not your sentences are structured in a way that is like, wow, well, excellent English. It's, it's all about vulnerability. This is what I really think and I'm going to share it to you. And I know and I can only hope that you will take it in the best way possible. Those make the best speeches and all speeches are storytelling. A lot of times coming from a person who just rewrote a minister's speech early this morning because I'm creative directing the patron of the arts event and the new minister of arts is going to speak. And my note to him is, if you are going to speak for the first time to the arts community, make yourself vulnerable or else people are going to click off Zoom and they're going to immediately think that you do not understand them and they will not feel good. They will not feel listened to and they will not want to listen to you. So vulnerability is not about here I am, hit me, hurt me. No. Vulnerability is about, I'm going to just trust you so that we can have a real conversation. And you may not agree with everything that I say, but all I ask 
is that you spend the next one minute or 30 minutes with me to just listen and think about it, consider without any, you know, any hard judgment. That's all we can hope for. And then the dialogue begins and then the stories begin and then you can really start to go somewhere as opposed to talking at somebody or being talked at, which you hear a lot of in Singapore radio, which, which is because even though they are DJs and they're talking into a microphone, even though I'm a camera actor and I'm acting on camera, you still must learn how to listen. You see? And that is the hard part of storytelling. It's not the telling of the story, but it's how to listen to your audience. Even if you can't see them, even if you can't hear them, you know, ultimately that's, that's what it's all about. Um, my last point about what worked in all four of the stories is that a story is told within a particular context. And here is where I'm going to go into the next section because I know that, that I've got that 15 minutes. My next section is about who are we when we are telling a story and why are we telling this story? So my next section is about that. The four people that I picked on to tell a story knew because they received an email, like all of you, prepare a story. You are going to enter into this Zoom conference with volunteers that are all united under this umbrella called Open House. We all know what Open House is. It is an arts walk. Immediately, you know who your audience is which will tell you why I am telling this story. It's very important. It's always important, no matter where you are. Even like, for example, even if it's something very intimate, when I know I have to tell my daughter something that I think is important, I still must know why I want to tell her this. And the fact that she's my daughter will inform my tone. And, and that worked for all four stories. The stories were short because we all knew that we have one and a half hours. The stories were thought through and somehow there was a level of trust because they were all very personal stories. And that trust probably came from the fact that we all kind of know that we are already the converted because we're all under this one umbrella. As opposed to, let's say, going back to a whole series of storytelling that I just heard, which is part of the election. When you are part of the Workers' Party, when you are part of the PAP, and you are telling a story, stroke, speech, you are telling the story to convert. Now, very different why we are telling that story. If I was telling you a story to convert, the way and the energy with which I tell my story will be very different. How I structure my story will be very different. But here, we all already knew we are safe the minute we logged on. The minute we could see each other and turned on the video, we know we are safe. We, we see Hui Xie, we, we see Su Pei and Philip. And because we are safe, all four stories immediately were vulnerable, immediately told everybody, including people that we didn't really know, something about yourself, you know, that made these people know us better. All of this is effective storytelling because at the end of the story, stroke, speech, stroke, presentation, stroke, I'm trying to extend your definition of storytelling and why storytelling is an important thing in our everyday lives, whether or not you are telling something to your kids or whatever. You want that person to understand you a little bit better at the end of the story. I felt close enough to Pao En to say, Pao En, can you stand up, turn around and <laughs> show us your tattoo? <laughs> you must take that as a compliment. That, that hey, 
as a fellow supporter of open house, stroke the arts community, stroke people that want to do something for this community that I care so much for and have devoted my life, I feel closer to you. You are now an ally. I am now your ally. You can also ask me something to do for you because now we know each other better. So if all of you were thinking that I was going to share like step by step, one, two, three, four, on how to tell a good story and all that, sadly, I can't do that. I can only share what I, I really think, which are some of these broader ideas and broader definitions about this thing called storytelling and to extend the definition of storytelling into something that each of you can use in your everyday life to understand that the word storytelling is not once upon a time and they live happily ever after. No, it's all sorts of different things. Who are we when we tell a story? This has... This is a very good follow-up from what we were just talking about, which is why are we telling this story? Before you start telling the story, you should understand who is the person that is telling the story. Now, under, for example, under this um, umbrella, uh, Pao En, Ernest, you all are telling stories as yourself. You know, um, because we are all unified. We all trust each other here. I can imagine that when um, Nicole Sia of Workers' Party and I sat through her entire one and a half hour IG live, I see that as storytelling. Okay? Um, her IG live post-election. To me, she was storytelling as one of the younger leaders of the Workers' Party because she knew that a lot of the people who are going to stick with her and even click on to the IG Live post-election will be of a particular age and will need to hear some things from her to enable her to continue the message Message is about storytelling and, to, and therefore to continue her work as one of the younger leaders of the Workers' Party. Now, when each of you lead a group, you know, on, let's say, a physical arts walk, which we hope will return in open house, you know the you that you are supposed to be. One, you are supposed to... Um, extend some information about this particular constituency, this particular building. You also know why you are leading this group. The you as a tour guide is not just a tour guide. It's you signed on to be a tour guide because you love Singapore. You, you know that you as a as a person who's going to be talking about something Singaporean, can do it in a way that no other person can do it. Unless you also know that, let's say, if you were leading this arts walk in Singapore, as a person who may be new to Singapore, that is your lens. As long as you know where you're coming from and who are the you that is telling this story. That's important. That's important. Because then when you share this story, it comes from somewhere real. And you won't be talking at somebody. Um, and people will believe you when you speak. You know? Um, I feel not enough people in Singapore, give themselves the right to know why they want to be there telling this particular story. You know, um, a parent who is going to 
tell a story to a child about something the child may not want to hear needs to understand why the parent, even though the person is the parent, needs to tell this story and then to find the best way to tell it so that your goal is achieved. The kid will not shut you off, but actually will listen. And, um, and therefore, the goals of the storytelling work. Um, I'm going to move on to the next section, which is what I consider to be some effective storytelling elements. And again, I'm going to go back to the four people who told stories and what worked for me. I heard Hokkien, okay? I heard the word COVID. I heard um, the word arduous. I heard the phrase typical Singaporean. I heard the word my aunt. Now, all these phrases in different ways immediately made me feel close to this person because all these words spoke to me. Um, I, I love vocabulary. I, I love it when an English word that is chosen carefully like arduous immediately reflects exactly what, with detail and nuance, exactly what the person um, is feeling. Um, I am a typical Singaporean, Ernest, you said that. And there are so many typical Singaporeans here. And many of the people that you're going to be talking to are typical Singaporeans. And immediately they go like, oh, Kaki Nang. Oh, he's one of us. Oh, I can trust him. So immediately. Hokkien, I'm Teochew. Okay. Immediately you spoke Hokkien. I understood what you said. And it made you special. And it made me special. Because I kind of felt like, oh, you, know, I, you know, as opposed to somebody speaking French. It's like, hey, we come from the same sort of clan, you know. So, all these things make you immediately listenable, you know. The word tattoo, you can bet you, Pao En, that everybody that you're talking to that has a tattoo will, or wants to get a tattoo will immediately go, oh, you know, I'll listen to this story a little bit more. Those are important things to think about. Because why? If you are leading a group of old guys who may not speak English the way you speak English, you have to remember who you are as a storyteller and who you're telling the story to. And you have to think a little bit about what are the other ways in which to tell your story. Because then you'll be speaking at them. Because then they won't understand, like how I understand, the word arduous. And then they, they will, you will lose them. And then what is the use of telling a story? We mustn't lose anybody. We must try not to lose anybody. So the first thing that I like to do when just before talking to a bunch of people is to look at them just for a little while. It can be a little bit unsettling. And maybe I'm an actress and I can handle my energy such that hopefully it doesn't turn people off. But as far as possible, I like to smile and look at everybody for just a few seconds because that first wave of assessing everyone will make the first thing that you want to say a little bit closer to I guess, having them listen to you. That's kind of, as opposed to, wah, click and then wah, just start talking. I think sometimes that could be a little bit, you know, you know, yeah. It's just like how if you're shouting across the hall to your kid, 
the first thing the kid does is you you I know she's not gonna listen to me. I know it. And then what's the use? So assessing your audience, I think that's important. There is also such a thing as um, over assessing your audience, which makes which in the theater we call too technical an actor then you turn off your entire audience because even if you are very, very good, you're not in the moment and there is no sharing because you have planned your scene from beginning to end. No matter what the audience is giving to you, no matter what your co-actor is giving to you, you just bulldoze your way through because you are only thinking of yourself and how you're, you're presenting and that creates a wall and then you don't become a good actor. You just become a real, you know, you're, to me, you're lying. You're just lying. You see? So, I've only got five more minutes before the end of this section. And then we're supposed to go into a half hour where, where you know, we're going to have some question and answer. But... Um, I'm just going to use that five minutes to just wrap up this particular section, which is called building a communion with your audience. Um, I know this sounds very highfalutin, um, but I believe that I don't want to even sometimes talk or spend time, which is the most precious thing that human beings have in their lives, with somebody, unless in some way, I have a good reason to build a communion with them. In another way, I mean, the reason why you might want to share something or tell a story should be steeped in some sort of a meaning for you or else you will just be wasting everybody's time, including your own. So before you, I even open my mouth out to talk, I assess to myself, do I want to be here? Do I really want to be here? Am I interested enough in these people? Am I committed enough to these people? Am I, do I feel enough for these people? to even open up my mouth or to even listen to them no matter what they have to say. I think more than ever, these are questions that all of us should ask of ourselves as human beings or else there is a lot of stuff that happens in our days, a lot of work that we do and time that we waste doing things that we don't feel for and saying things that we don't mean and not meaning what we say. And I think that ultimately just diminishes anything that we do, not just storytelling. So I just want to leave you all with this two phrases. The best way to storytell is to mean what you say and to say what you mean. And I think that not enough people do that. It sounds very, very simple, but it's actually very difficult because it also means that before you can tell a good story, you got to know yourself pretty well. You got to know your worldview and what you feel about things, what you feel about the things that you're going to be talking about. Okay. Ultimately, those are some of the things that, you know, I want to share. Um, I, I would, Fuishas, shall I, shall I carry on and, and, or, and Supe, listen to some questions that people have either typed in or want to ask me in sure. voice? Yep. Um, we can divide it into two seg segments for the Q&A. Um, so the first segment, I will share some of the questions that came in. Um, then after that, um, all of you can ask questions directly to King. Just um, raise your hand. When I call your name, you can unmute and share. All right? 
So um, hold on. It's so, okay. Yep. Yeah. Just ask me one question at one time so that yep. I can answer. And then also later on, you can ask me questions about anything that you think will benefit everybody in this group. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about storytelling, okay? So yeah, I mean, I just want to say that, okay? Okay, but yes, first question, Supe. All right. Um, how do you listen to your audience if you can't see or hear them? Yeah, that's the question. The first thing I do, okay, I'll give you an example, this particular group here. Um, the first thing I do is to find the gatekeepers. What are gatekeepers? The people that stand between me and the audience. Because I know I don't know all of you. So I went up to Supe, I went up to Hui Shi, I went up to Phil, I go up to Ellen, and I say, all right, who are these people? What are their age ranges? What do they do? What are they like? Of course, I also know some of you because I, I, I am and have been a part of Open House for a long time. So do a little bit of homework. Yeah, do a bit of homework and ask people, you know? So a lot of times, so for example, this afternoon, I'm doing um, a National Museum um, uh, Zoom. Uh, it's not a question and answer, but it's an official sort of like, um, actually it is like a question and answer. The National Museum is giving voice to some of their artifacts and then they are opening it up to a Zoom and people can ask the artifact. So I am an artifact and I'm voicing the character of the artifact, and then the people that listen don't know that it's me, but then they can ask this artifact questions. And I went for a rehearsal and I just completely questioned all the people, you know, in the, from the National Museum, as well as from the public relations firm, as well as the people that are handling all the technicals. It's a very big setup. It's the same... Um, sort of setup that um, so the same company uh, does uh, the setup for the political um, um, ministers speaking to like they had green screen and everything you know in this particular setup it was really quite an amazing place to be in so I would say do your homework and find out because once you find out about your audience that's the first step of listening because if you know your audience are going to be five-year-old kids, immediately you already know what are some of the things that you have to do. For me, if I know my audience is five-year-old kids, I'll say thank you very much. I'm not the right person to talk to them. I mean, that's in a way listening to your audience too. You know, how to find the right person to speak to the right audience, pairing it up together. Um, okay, so next question. Um, is related. So how do you access audience? Like, do you look at them and then start profiling them? Um, it differs from audience to audience. Um, I have done, um, okay. For a live audience, when I am on stage and in character, of course I cannot profile them like how I'm profiling all of you right now because I cannot look at them straight in the eye or else I will lose character, right? But via osmosis, and, I, and this is not as intimidating a word as you all may think it is, I can feel if I have them. When they are very still, when they're not fanning themselves. C certainly when they're not checking their phones. I know that I have not broken the chain of energy that is between me and them as a performer and an audience. But I have also felt many times when I'm not performing well that I am losing them because they may be fidgety. You know, they, they may be, um, they may be, you can see that they're, they're somehow they're not, their attention is not towards the stage. And, and I can feel that in a live audience. On camera, 
right? Uh, the, my audience are also the people that are on set with me. My fellow actors, my director, my director of photography. They are people too. They are audience too. Directors can cry when they are moved. Your wardrobe person who is looking through the camera and and even though her job is to make sure that there is no wardrobe malfunction, they are immersed in the scene if you are performing well. So again, I can read them. They are people too. I am very sure that for each of you who have led an arts walk, you have come back from a particular walk even though you do this walk day in, day out, and you kind of know when the audience was with you. And you also kind of know when on that particular day, for some particular reason, you lost them. Um, I would say that uh, it is important to be... Because... If the work that we do requires storytelling, requires audience, it is important to come back and assess a little bit our performance, whether or not by ourselves or not. And, you know, just to come back and spend a few minutes thinking, wow, today was a good day. Why? How come? Not to beat yourself up too much, but just so that you mark for yourself and you say to yourself, oh, it could be because the day was cool and people were com comfortable. Oh, it could be because today, you know, today I felt really happy. Oh, it could be because today, you know, half the people were people who knew me. I'm not judging anything. It could be a variety of reasons, but it's important that you kind of know. Yeah. Why do you think we always begin our performances with free preview? Because then all our friends will come and then all of them will support us. And then we start off the first paid performance feeling good about ourselves. There's that phrase again. Because we have to perform. Um, next. All right. I got three more before we open up to the floor. Yeah, um, this one's quite fun. What's the most difficult audience you had to story tell to on your reverse uh, favorite one? I hate, hate, hate performing to sponsors. Anything to do with money within the reason why this audience is there is the biggest, thickest wall that I will ever encounter. Because there's something about money that brings out something awful in people. And they start to assess the world and everything in the world in a different way. So I don't care if people come to listen to me and they don't agree with me at all and they quarrel with me. So for example, okay, so all quarrels really are storytelling, you know. Let me tell you why, I, let me tell you this story. No, that's the way, that's how you should look at storytelling. All praise, all quarrel, you know, it's a story, you know, it's like, this hey me is terrible because, you know, that, you know, it's a story. It's actually a very compelling story. And I don't mind that the people quarrel with me in the Kopitiam, you know, because they disagree with me that they are, they hey me is good. But what is very difficult is when, you know, the money comes in the way, which is, I paid, <laughs> you know, or I gave $100,000, I deserve. You see how it's like, 
I deserve to have this. I deserve to feel this. That you paid to deserve to feel good. Oh, I, I don't know how to make you feel good that way. I just don't. I don't know how to do it. You know? Now that's to say I... That's not to say I don't want your money. I really need your money. I really do. But I also really feel that I hope you gave your money. I'm sorry if I didn't make it happen for you the way that you wanted it to. Uh, and yeah, I hope that by giving the money, you didn't come here just sitting back, feeling, you know, feeling good about yourself because of the money that you paid as opposed to because of the performance that you're being given, you know? It's like, it's a no-win situation. I really don't know how to make anybody happy that way. So the corporate nights, the corporate galas, I can, I can tell you all performers will tell you this. The corporate galas, we are all sitting in the dressing room and we're all going like, let's just get through tonight. <laughs> And then have to get out there into the gala dinner and go, hi, <laughs> how are you? And you know, everybody will tell you good things, but the feeling is very, very different from talking to an audience, you know, on any other night. My favorite audiences. My favorite audiences are... Um, my favorite audiences are um, uh, my favorite audiences are the most vulnerable audiences. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times uh, I come out of performing for them, uh, feeling even more vulnerable than them because they have taught me something. Uh, I'll give you an example. Performing to, um, let's say, uh, people that may want to perform as much as I do, but for some reason may not be able to, either because they may not physically be able to, or um, something like that. Uh, performing to a group of people uh, within a subject matter that has a particular, um, very deep, um, very deep real life effect on them. Uh, so for example, uh, in some of the plays that I've done, which are about very difficult, uh, difficult emotions, and knowing that today's audience are going to be parents who are going through the same thing, and, uh, and knowing that you owe it to yourself and you owe it to them because what they're going through in real life is, you know, one million, infinitely just so much more difficult than the character that you are playing, even though the character may be very difficult to play. And it just makes you humble and it gives you all the reason why you are telling this story today and why you need to be good at what you do and why you need to be a good person as well as a good performer. And that's what makes life really meaningful and that's what makes art very, very meaningful. And I know I sound very romantic, but I do believe in the romance of everything that we do or else I wouldn't be as good a performer as I am and I wouldn't still be doing it today and still being so in love with it. I feel in love with this industry every single day and I fly off into the eye of the virus next week. Why? back into LA because my work is going to start because I'm in love. And if you were in love with a person and this person is away in the eye of the virus, wouldn't you fly off? Yes, you would. And it's a great way to live. So, yep. Thanks, King. Okay, second last question. Um, when thinking about self-improvement, how do you balance thinking about your authentic voice or story and the feedback that you receive? The short answer, it's, it's very difficult. 
and only the best people, which is why I think it's important that you understand storytelling is more about the dialogue. It's not just about yourself. It's also about the other person because every single day of our lives and in the things that we do, particularly the things that we are in love with um, and feel passion for, it's so important to know yourself what is good as well as what is bad. You know, which is why sometimes to be your authentic self is a very difficult thing because sometimes you, you are, you know, storytelling is a mirror. You know, when people don't like your stories, it tells you some things you may not want to hear about yourself. But if you are brave enough to at some point in your life, it doesn't have to be instantaneous, okay? I'm not asking everybody to be superhuman, to be able to wrap your head around the flaws as well as the power within yourself, then I think that, that okay, you're one step further to being authentic. And authenticity is a lifelong, lifelong endeavor. And you must forgive yourself if at some point in your life, you weren't as authentic at some other points and at some other points, you know, your authenticity got you into a lot of trouble. I mean, we're all human and we all go through that. And the most important thing is to just keep seeing it as a daily endeavor to strive for some sort of authenticity, you know, and then we can address the other part, which is when, when we are at peace with some sort of authenticity within ourselves, we are able to harness that to tell our stories better. So, for example, um, a lot of times I feel that I am able to play certain characters better than others. Uh, it's because I have let's say, for example, a parent playing, playing a mother, okay, playing a mother. So I'm flying off to play a mother, right, in Vancouver. And I just feel like, wow, it's so easy to act. Why? Because <laughs> every day of my life, I'm a mother. And so many times when I read these lines, I know exactly how that feeling feels like. Authenticity, you know, as opposed to somebody who has, I'm not saying that if you've never been a mother, you can't play a mother. No, loads of people can. You know, but for me, I, it cuts a little bit closer to some of the real feelings that I have in everyday life. Um, so it's a daily endeavor. And then just keep, you know, working at it. That's all. The, uh, what I don't want anybody to do is to continue to be false. <laughs> Continue to say things because you feel everybody wants to hear things. Hear it this way. Continue to say what you don't mean. You know, continue to be afraid, you know, to say things. I would really rather you try to find a way to say what you really feel as opposed to keep what you really feel in, you know, and not say it at all. Just, just spend some time trying to say what you really feel, but in a way that you think will help everybody understand your feeling, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, there's a Winnie. Uh, Winnie wants to ask because she can't open her, her cam or and her sure. background is a bit noisy. So yeah. Winnie would like to ask, in the theatre production, yeah. we work with the same script and directions. How do you as an actor do excesses? Do... What, how do you as an actor do to access the room and tweak the way you story tell? Uh -huh. Especially when every audience is different and they respond differently. Well, your questions are very good. No, very good. All your questions are very good. Okay, Winnie, the technique is being in the moment. And, and this is a technique that, that every storyteller, no matter what sort of story you can you can uh, you, you need to tell at any one moment in, in your life. The technique is a difficult one and it is how to be organic, it is how to react, and it is how to be in the moment at any one time. 
Okay, so even though I have the same script, when I am up saying the same line with my fellow actor, and my fellow actor is saying the same line to me, the moment is more or less the same, but we have to keep it real. So, so in a sense, even though it is my you know, fifth time performing this exact same line, that moment still has to be real. And the way to make it real is to really listen to the line from my fellow actor and then to react back in a real time, you see? So like, for example, I see some of you nodding, quite a lot of you nodding to what I just said. Now, you all are nodding at a time that is in a real time because you all are listening to me in real time. Of course, this is the first time that we're all talking to each other, okay? But if you have the ability to listen well, again, um, to, a, you know, to a similar uh, line, you, again, this authenticity, this dialogue, this energy that is being passed from one person to the other, to the other, to the other, um, will happen again. Um, so when you're a storyteller, try not to own self-act. Okay, we, performers call it that, don't own self-act. So I always tell people when you have to actually, whatever it is that you have to do, if you have to do it in front of a live audience, or you have to do it in front of an audience, please do not practice in front of a mirror. Don't. Because that is not real. You cannot practice in front of a mirror. You know? Um, it's very detrimental, actually. Because then you don't learn. You don't learn how to listen. And part of the listening is you don't really know what the person is going to do or to say. So you... You have to be vulnerable and then you have to just sit there and you just have to listen <laughs> and then you have to trust that you will react, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So, I know that sounds kind of mojo. But does that make sense to you all? You know, it, it, it's not a science, you see. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, storytelling is not a science, you know. Yeah. So, so it's a lie that, you know, when on TV, people always act like we should act in, we should look at ourselves in the mirror and then try to see how we are acting or gesturing. So, so is that a lie? So we shouldn't be doing that? We shouldn't be acting in front of a mirror, no. No. I think it's just the weirdest thing to do. And, you know, dancers, I mean, I would, you can ask all, all, dancers dance in front of a mirror. Why? Because one, for coordination. And two, because dancing is technique. Dancing is science. And you have to kind of look at your form. But let's say storytelling comes from the heart. And you cannot see your heart. And so if you, you know, I mean, I, I, that's what I believe in. That's what I believe in. And a lot of the best actors to me are the actors that when you look at them, you know that they are not, that they haven't practiced this down to a T. I'm going to cry at this line. I mean, you know, it just comes out very technical and somewhat dishonest, you know. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you. I'll open up the floor. Anyone wants to ask King directly? Any questions? Yeah, go for it. So shy. No, no questions? No? Has oh, Zaki. Oh, yay. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks so much again. Uh, this has been really, really useful. Uh, my question is how... Do you have any tips on how to um, how to uh, change the 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 rhythm of the room or 
if if you feel like you're losing the audience or or or, or your space, like how like because sometimes you know if you're storytelling and then you can feel the atmosphere change and then you can feel like you're yeah. losing them. How do you bring them back in? Like, do you have any tips on that? Do you realize that? I don't know how many of you have come from a corporate, um, a corporate um, uh, sort of like a uh, job or something like that. And do you realize, um, okay, so I worked in corporate for nearly 11 years of my life. And during the dinner and dances, right, the CEO who has the most power in the entire corporation comes up in front of every single employee and does something stupid. Okay? The CEO who signs your paycheck, who, you know, gives you your appraisal, who has so much power, suddenly does something really silly and puts on a silly costume and just basically makes himself, the, you know, open to everybody. That, to me, has always worked. That at some point, if you just sort of like go, okay, guys, something I'm not doing, you know, to actually say it, you know, to actually be open and go like, okay, you know, be open about needing help. <laughs> Sometimes it works. Sometimes it works. In a very informal um, arts walk, uh, you know, where you have an audience of maybe 10 or whatever, I dare say that will probably work. You know, are you guys okay? Are you guys okay is the, doing the same thing, which is stopping what I'm doing and kind of opening up the room to allow, allow them to breathe, allow them to, you know, to respond, you know. Sometimes changing the subject helps. Like if you feel that you're giving too many facts and you're losing them, then talk about the chicken rice or talk about lunch or talk about something else, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes what makes a one storyteller better than the other is being able to think on your feet. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, those people who are like able to think on their feet. Sometimes having a sense of humor really helps. Cracking a joke, you know. <laughs> it's not easy. But um, one or all of those things have helped before. And then we just have to hope for the best. <laughs> Anyone else? No last call for questions? No? Uh, I'll go. Ah. Okay, question? Oh yeah, so uh, I guess just to maybe wrap things up, uh, King, I have a Kepo question to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you doing now and like maybe what are you working on next? You can share, would you like to share with us? where we will see you again. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going through an emotional week because for the first time I'm flying off uh, back to LA and then, and then I'll, from LA I'll go up to Vancouver. And I'm emotional because um, for the first time I can't say to the two closest people in my life, my mom and my daughter, and I can't tell them when I'll be back because of the two-week quarantine in Vancouver and the two-week quarantine uh, here in Singapore. Um, but, um, yep, I'm, I'm very thankful. I've got very good work. I don't know how many of you watch the CW, um, which produces Riverdale and Arrow and, um, Sabrina, but their next series, one of their new series is called Kung Fu and I play the mother of the lead. And so we're going there to film 13 episodes in Vancouver where everything is filmed. My house is in the same city as the Riverdale village, as Riverdale. So my studio is the same studio as the Sabrina studio. 
So it's all very nice and it's a wonderful, very humble group of actors whom I got to know because we filmed the pilot and they're really, really lovely people from all over the world. Um, um, I, I desperately need um, moments like this to keep my support of everything that I love that is in the arts that is happening in Singapore and all my friends and the people that work with me know that I always make time for that despite the fact that I'm away a lot of the times. I will wake up in the middle of the night and attend board meetings and it is so heartening for me to see all of you um, supporting this industry that I, I love so much and I hope that somehow you all find ways to grow that love in your heart and to be able to keep doing things, you know, in small and big ways by volunteering, by telling stories, which ultimately is the beginning of a lot of art, maybe all art, you know, storytelling is the beginning of all art. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to shamelessly now uh, ask, any of you who are interested in, in following me on my journey by uh, going to my Instagram, which is at Kenghua. And um, I've just started a new website designed by my daughter. She's so great. Um, it's just tangkenghua.com. And I put all sorts of things there. And I think it comes from a desperate need to try and connect because I can feel quite isolated away. And I am very romantic about this industry that I'm in. I am all about connection. So I deeply believe in it and, um, and I want to keep doing it. So, so yeah, it's corny, but that's who I am. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing, King, and we wish you, you all the best. <laughs> and thumbs up, you saved there. <laughs> thank yeah. you, thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah. Okay, so I guess this, um, this is the end of our session. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. And uh, oh, one last thing before you leave. We'll be very, very grateful if you can help us to complete our survey, which I will throw out as a poll in a minute. Yeah, so... Um, oh, I see messages from Sarah. Thank you, too. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, let me just throw out the poll. Yep, so um, if you guys are busy, I guess the time is up also. Um, it, was, it was really nice to see everyone, to, to see some faces I haven't seen before. If any of you want to just chill and hang, you can just stay on. We now have a premium Zoom account, so we don't have a time limit. <laughs> Yay. I, on the other hand, am going to leave. So I'll say my goodbyes mm. here um, and get ready for my three o'clock. Um, another Zoom um, but thank you very much and I hope to see all of you either on my page please subscribe if you want to only if you want to, no judgement and on my Instagram bye bye bye, bye. <laughs>